evening. My name is Mark Syme, the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. Welcome to the PM services of our church uh, for uh, Sunday, October the 20th. We will sing a few songs, observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a short message for you that I hope will be beneficial to all of us. Here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. So if you have that book, that'd be great if you want to sing along. If not, uh, I will give you the name of the song so that you can either find it in your songbook or Google the song uh, and get to sing along with us. Some of these songs are pretty familiar. You may know some of them by memory. The first song we will sing is number 716, 716. The title is Sing to Me of Heaven. Sing to Me of Heaven. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace. From the soils that bind me, it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing, so showers of great blessing or my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me of shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven when I walk alone, dreaming of the comrades that so long have gone. In a fairer region among the angel throng, they are happy as they sing that all sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me of shadows of the evening fall, sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low, till the shadow o'er me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that all sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me on shadows round the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. If you would turn to number 874, Walking Alone at Eve. 874, Walking Alone at Eve. Walking alone at Eve and viewing the skies of Par. Bidding the darkness come to welcome me, silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. God in his power and might is showing his truth and love. Look for a home with God, a place in his courts to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole, and live with my God above. Sitting alone at eve, and dreaming the hours away. 
watching the shadows falling. Now at the close of day, God in his mercy comes with the word is drawing near. Spreading his love and truth around me and everywhere. Oh, for a home with God, place in his courts to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole, and live with my God above. Closing my eyes at eve, and thinking of heaven's grace. Longing to see my Lord, yes, meeting Him face to face. Trusting Him as my all, wherever my footsteps roam. Leading with Him to guide me onto the Spirit's home. Oh, for a home with God, a place in His courts to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole, and live with my God above. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 315, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. 315, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3. 1, 2, and 3. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory died my richest gain I count but loss and more contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. See from His hand his hands, his feet, sorrow and love's loving all down. Dear, there's such love and sorrow meet, or those composed The signature verse in our New Testament is the 20th chapter of Acts in verse 7, when Paul was preaching to uh, a group at the city of Troas, and he said very succinctly, uh, now they gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. And so every first day of the week, every, every time that uh, we meet together, uh, one of the basic things that we are to do is to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We do do this by observing the Supper of the Lord, which uh, Jesus instituted on the night in which he was betrayed in that upper room with his disciples. Uh, to make this even firmer in the New Testament, in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul uh, 
almost word for word, explains the partaking of the bread and the wine and what it signifies. So as we gather about the table, we will uh, take something that symbolizes the body that uh, Jesus gave up for us, and we will take of something uh, that symbolizes the blood which he said, shed for our sins. Let's give thanks for the bread. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that in your divine wisdom, at just the right time, you sent Jesus to us. We're so grateful for his teachings, for his wisdom, for his goodness that he displayed for each one of us. And at this time, we just thank you for allowing him to sacrifice himself one time for all, to sacrifice himself for the sins of the world so that your grace might fall upon us. As we partake of this bread, help us to remember the physical sacrifice and the pain that racked his body as he hung on the cross. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. In the song that we just sang, it says, See from his head, from his hands, from his feet, sorrow and love flow mingle down. That was the blood that Jesus shed for us. Uh, let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. We're ever so thankful, dear God, for Jesus' willingness to go to the cross, to shed his innocent blood, we know that this blood is the blood of our salvation. We know that this blood is the blood that washes away our sins. So as we partake, let's partake it with all gravity, with all seriousness, knowing that it is that precious blood that Jesus shed for us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. With the Lord's Supper being completed, we also remember at the first day of the week that uh, we are to give back to the Lord that which we have prospered. Uh, Paul lets us know about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And so it is as we have prospered, it is um, giving back to the Lord what is his own. We come to understand that um, we are to help the poor, that we are to bring others to the Lord. We know that it's just not possible to do this without the physical means of uh, having a place where we can meet together and uh, being stewards of yours, of the monies which are given so that your will can be carried out. Let's pray for the giving. Dear Heavenly Father, we're uh, so grateful that uh, we have this opportunity to give. Help us to give cheerfully. Help us to give sacrificially, knowing that uh, these monies will be used so that others would hear about the Lord, so that those that are in need can be fed, that we can be a evangelistic church, and a benevolent church. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Uh, the last song that we'll sing is number 860. Beautiful song called There Is a Habitation. 860. There is a habitation. <laughs> There is a habitation built by the living God for all of every nation who seek that grand abode. 
Zion, lovely Zion, I long my gates to see. Oh, lovely Zion, lovely Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? A city with foundations, Firm as the eternal throne, nor wars nor desolations shall ever move a stone. O Zion, lovely Zion, I long thy gates to see. O lovely Zion, lovely Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? No night is there, no sorrow, no death and no decay. No yesterday, no morrow, but one eternal day. O oh, Zion, lovely Zion, I long thy gates to see. O oh, lovely Zion, lovely Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? Within its pearly portals, angelic armies sing with glorified immortals the praises of this King. Zion, lovely Zion, I long thy gates to see, O oh, lovely Zion, lovely Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? Oh, that concludes the song service of singing praises to the Lord. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, getting to sing praises to the Lord is so wonderful uh, because the Lord is our God and we ought to praise him in any way possible. Um, you may have noticed that the uh, tenor of the songs uh, this evening were about heaven. And uh, this is going to be the last in this series of lessons uh, that uh, I have uh, presented over the past couple of months that uh, were entitled The Way of Christ. And I'm going to go through each of those at the very end of this lesson. But this is the culminating lesson in all of the things that are uh, the way of Christ. Because this evening, we are going to talk about the way to glory. All right? And so, uh, all of the things that we have talked about dealing with the way of Christ, uh, the way of God, the way of truth, the way of life, the way of love, the way of joy, the way of peace, the way of unity, the way of prayer, the way of forgiveness, uh, the way of bearing fruit, the way, way of uh, service, and the way of suffering, all lead up to our goal in life. And our goal in life is to go to heaven. Our goal in life is to live with God eternally. And I have put and couched that in the terms being the way to glory. And so with that, in this final lesson, we will look at the way to glory, understanding that Jesus said to us in Matthew 25, verse 31, that one day he will come. And more specifically, he said one day 
he will come in glory. And this is something that we're to wait for. This is something that we have in front of us. Now, this may happen after our physical bodies have died. It may happen while we're still alive. We don't know. We know that we are told that he will return like a thief in the night. We are actually told that even Jesus himself didn't know exactly when he would return, but only the Father that is in heaven. With that in mind, we are to wait for his return. Because when he returns, the return will involve the judgment of the whole world. And so first I would like to touch on the promise of God, the promise of God to glory. Now first, the promise was given by Jesus himself. In John chapter 12, in verse 26, Jesus says that we are to honor those who serve him. And uh, further on in John chapter 17 and verse 24, he said to be with Jesus, to behold his own glory, things that we have to look forward to. And uh, to put it in, in lovely uh, figurative terms, in Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 43, he said, to shine as the sun, to shine as the sun in the kingdom of our Father. This is the wonderful promise that Jesus himself gave to us. Now, when the Holy Spirit was poured upon the apostles on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after his resurrection, that same promise, because they were guided by the Holy Spirit, was given by the apostles. The two apostles that did uh, a lot of writing were the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul says, we are called by the gospel for this very purpose. What purpose? The purpose that we would one day receive the glory of God. And you know what? He said that it won't be a bed of roses in life. Christianity is a hard life. It's one in which we have to give things up to get things. We have to give things of the world up so we can receive those things that are of glory. And so, uh, Paul said that to us. He said, the things that we experience now as we grow as Jesus' disciples, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, will lead us down the path to glory. And you know what? We're told that we may suffer for what we believe. Uh, uh, part of the suffering is the giving up of many things, but we may physically suffer in some way. But our temporary light afflictions are nothing like the affliction that Jesus felt as he was scorned and as he was crucified. And sometimes with us, this will be a, a temporary weight on us. That's weight, W-E-I-G-H-T. However, with that, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, and Romans chapter 8, verse 16, these temporary light afflictions will result in the eternal weight of glory. And uh, 
Paul explains it pretty graphically. In Colossians 3, verse 4, he says that we shall appear with Christ in glory. And uh, he also says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 10 and 12, that we will be glorified together with him, that we'll be joint heirs, if you would. Romans chapter 8 verses 16 and 17. These are the things that the Holy and Spirit-inspired Apostle Paul said. Let's look at some of the things that the Holy Spirit-inspired Peter said. He said that the glory will come to those that have genuine faith. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. To those that serve faithfully, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 4. And in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, we have been called to God's eternal glory. These are the words from the pen of uh, the Holy Spirit-inspired Apostle Peter. Why do Paul and Peter... Uh, tell us all these things about our home and glory? Well, I think it's for encouragement. I think it's because he encourages us to be faithful and to remain faithful and to be steadfast in what we believe because the way of Christ is given to us. With that, we have the description of glory. All right, we have the description of glory. First, in the terms of our resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42 to 44 and 50 to 53, and I'm paraphrasing, it says we're raised to glory with an incorruptible uh, spiritual body, an immortal body. And Philippians 3, 20 to 21 says that our lowly bodies will be conformed to Jesus' glorious body. Aren't these, aren't these wonderful things to give thought to? This is what we have in front of us as the way to Christ being the way to glory. And then in terms of our eternal destiny, uh, in Revelation chapter 21, uh, verses 1 through 7, we have the eternal city, the new Jerusalem. That's what heaven is called. The great city, the holy Jerusalem, also in Revelation 21. Uh, it's illuminated. There is no night there. Uh, Revelation 21, 22, and 23. Jesus is the light. Isn't it wonderful as we finish this series of lessons about the way of God or the way of Christ that it all culminates in what our goal in life is? We remember that, that in, in, in the book of Philippians uh, chapter 2 that, that Paul said, I haven't attained it yet, but I strive. I continue to strive for the upward call of God through Jesus Christ. This is what we need to be doing. We need to be describing. The, we, we need to be uh, just moving toward that, striving toward that. And we should be steadfast and immovable, knowing that our toils in the Lord uh, will be appreciated uh, this comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. And so with that in mind, as we finish the lesson, let's sum it up. With such a hope of glory, isn't the way of Christ worth following? Isn't understanding 
that Jesus is the way to God. It's the only way because of Jesus' atoning death. Isn't it the one wonderful that it's the way to truth? As Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. Isn't it wonderful that it's the way to life? Both abundant life now and the glory that we just talked about. Isn't it wonderful that it's the way of love? Loving God and our brethren, even loving our enemies, as Jesus told us. Isn't it wonderful that it's the way of joy, responding to the riches of God's grace, our real joy in life? Isn't it wonderful that it's the way of peace, peace with God, peace with self, and peace with others? Isn't it wonderful that it's the way of unity, following Jesus and Jesus alone? Isn't it wonderful that it's the way of prayer, how we communicate with God and his example of prayer that he gave? Isn't it wonderful that it's the way of forgiveness, as Jesus, when he was on the cross, said to forgive them because they don't know what they're doing? Isn't it wonderful that it's the way of bearing fruit, proving to be disciples of God by glorifying God? Isn't it wonderful that it's the way of service, that we have the opportunity to serve one another just as Jesus served? And isn't it wonderful, even though we're not called upon to suffer, that if need be, for righteousness' sake, we will suffer for Jesus Christ? And finally, as we culminate this series of lessons, isn't it wonderful that it's the way to glory and the understanding that one day we will be glorified together with Christ for eternity. I hope that this series of lessons has been beneficial to, to as much to you as it has to me in preparing it and studying for them. And so the, the theme of the lesson is the way of Christ. And with that in mind, we need to understand that this is the first step that we must take in life. We must assume and assimilate the way of Christ. How do we do that? We obey his words of truth. We obey the gospel of Christ in faith, in repentance, in confession, and in baptism. This is what we are to do. This is our invitation to all of you this evening. And if you are Christians already, it is abiding in the truth. It is abiding in the Christian doctrine, in the fellowship of this church, so we can have that hope of heaven eternal. If you need to come to the Lord tonight, this is your invitation to do so. Get in touch with one of us, and we will be glad to assist in any way. Let's close in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for uh, the understanding that as people in this world, if we are to truly understand what life is all about, we need to understand the way of Christ. We need to understand that at just the right time, you sent Jesus to us, that he taught like no one else ever taught, that he performed miracles to let people know who he was, that he died, was buried, and resurrected from the dead and appeared to many people, giving us the understanding that Jesus is not just the Son of Man, but the Son of God. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we walk through this life. Help us to walk through the life, understanding that we have to walk it as our way to Christ. And the way to Christ leads to eternity. Bless us in this life. Help us to be godly, moral people. Help us to strive for perfection in all that we do that we may one day live with you eternally. We pray this in his most holy name. 
Amen. Please be safe, and may God bless you all. Amen.